I would like to welcome you to the 21st class in the UBC Ecosystem Modeling course FIS 501. Today's topic is spatial modeling. I will be giving you an introduction to spatial modeling, building on what Jeroen uh, Steinbeck mentioned last Thursday. And then I will go through a tutorial building an ecosystem model and show you some of the things that I look for when doing that. I would like to start off by acknowledging that we here at UBC is at Coast Salish territory and we acknowledge that we are on the traditional, ancestral and unceded territories of the Moskun people, the Slewatut people and the Squamish people. Also, let me remind you that recordings of these sessions are available at the Ecopart YouTube channel and at the Facebook page of of the Echo Park. And also that it's actually cherry blossom time in Vancouver right now. We have about oh, 100,000 cherry blossom tree, cherry trees and uh, it's a delightful time of the year. Also the lectures, tutorials, assignments, schedule is available at the uh, course website which you will find at the address listed here. And uh, that's about it for the introduction. So let's go and uh, as mentioned the plan is today to go through the um, uh, to give an introduction to Ecospace and uh, that will be and then uh, which will be a fairly quick one there's not going to be that much theory because we covered a lot of that with the um, Ecopart and Ecosim classes we've had earlier uh, but a little bit of new. And then we're going to go to uh, open up Ecospace and uh, go through a tutorial where I will basically walk you through the tutorial and also tell you what I look for when working with a spatial model. This is a simple one, but uh, it can be much more complex as you'll hear about on Thursday, for instance. We have three modules main modules in Ecopart. Uh, they are Ecopart, where you create the mass balance snapshot, Ecosim, from time dynamic simulations, and Ecospace for spatial temporal dynamics. Maybe I should tell you that years ago when we started with this, uh, we were developing Ecopart, and you know, Ecopart just being able uh, to create a food web was a major step, uh, which we were pretty happy with. Uh, and there was, uh, you know, I did my net network on my PhD on network analysis, just what you can learn from looking at the food web of the of the basis on that, on that, and that's. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like picture analysis, all the things you can deduct just from looking and analyzing a food web. But it doesn't answer what if questions. For those, you have to go to a model where you can look at dynamics, how things change over time. If this, then that. To answer that kind of questions, it, you need dynamics. And dynamics is something like an ecosystem, the time they're moving around, you have to get that component in to do it. Now, when we were starting this off, we had a workshop in, it was in, I think in 94, uh, shortly after Daniel Pauli moved from Manila to, uh, to UBC. And we had this big workshop here uh, on the Northwest Pacific, we call it, um, the northeastern part of the Pacific. For some strange reason in North America it's called the Northwest Pacific. Uh, they look at it from the land side. And uh, at this workshop we were probably about, this, the fishery center, probably about something like 25, 30 people, including Jeff Polovina, who came, the father of, of, uh, of the original Ecopart, who came and, and we spent a week there developing three or four ecosystem models. And while this happened, um, Carl Walters, who had been working more than any of us on ecosystem models and also given up on it, uh, walked through that room, the Ralph York room, a number of times. And what he, uh, what he noticed there was that, first of all, this was um, 
simple modeling where that was not designed to answer what if questions like like he had been working on for with the time dynamic models that they had been developing um, and given up on. But this was based on what do we know about this ecosystem, how to describe this ecosystem, and it provided a really good uh, starting point for it. And that's one of the things that, that got him interested. That's actually one of the unique things about Ecopart, that we are creating a very solid foundation for the dynamic analysis to come afterwards. So it was a, a quite a... a um, happy coincidence in many ways that led to Carl becoming involved in this and that the Ecopark provided the foundation for dynamic analysis, really uh, data informed foundation. That's a key aspect of this. But it is just that, it's just a data foundation. With Ecopark we create a mass balance model or a thousand mass balance or ten thousands that can start as a st that can be a starting point for the dynamic simulations. So that was the purpose of it, and that's what we did. And it's, a, it's pretty good at that. But when it comes to dynamics, you, uh, you have to use a dynamic model, so you can answer the what-if questions. And that's where you get into EchoSim. And if those questions are spatially explicit, we have to go to a spatially explicit model. Yeah, it's that simple. That's how it works. Uh, but it also, it's worth remembering that the simplest model that can address the research question that you have is the best model to use. That's the rule, golden rule of, of modeling. This means that if your questions can be answered by, with Equipart, do it. Don't use Equispace because you think that, oh, it's a more complex model, it's a better model, it gives a better description, you can see where things are, and so on. That's not a good argument. You have to focus on what's, what is the right for your question. Is it spatially explicit? So if we get things like um, uh, impact on marine protected areas, you can't answer that without with a temporal model. You have to make a spatially explicit model because it only impacts part of the ecosystem modeling area. Sure, if the uh, if all of the area is um, is going to be close to fishing, then you can analyze it. But then it's not really a marine protected area modeling. It's not, you know, then it's an area say with no fishing, so that can be expressed with a time dynamic. Um, but again, use the simplest possible model. And it, there's no sequence. That, the sequence you see up here with Ecopart, Ecosim, Ecospin is simple, or you can even say, some would say it's uh, complex, more complex, and even more complex. It doesn't need to be like that. We can work with them. So it's a simple model and a simple, somewhat more complex. A simple model, less simple, and even less simple to express it the other way around with Ecospace. You, you can do it like that. It doesn't have to be complex, but it can be. Uh, one thing that's quite clear is that it's not a question of being a good model, a better model, and the best model. That's not how it works. It is more complex and more capable of answering more complex questions. But the questions have to drive it. So, Ecospace is a time dynamic, spatially explicit model. And it's called here a simulation tool. Um, it, and that's what it is. It's a complex simulation tool for addressing. can be a complex spatial simulation. Complex simulation tool for addressing spatial questions. That's what it can be. It's designed to predict spatial patterns of, of fisheries and species and how they interact and how they developed over time and space. And from the when we started this, the first questions related to spatial management options, for instance, such as marine protected areas. But we are increasingly seeing it being used to address other questions as well. On Thursday, you will hear Kim de Mutzert 
talk about uh, the Mississippi River and things that uh, they've been working with there on implications of um, changing of sediments and of, of changing the uh, the way that the flow on, on the Mississippi. And uh, Vasu Capucci will be talking about uh, the Roberts Bank Terminal here. So what are the consequences of building this two square kilometer terminal in, in a major Salmon River estuary? Uh, and how and the whole pre process around environmental impact assessment, which if we compare it to getting a paper published, peer review and so on, I would say compared to getting a paper published in, in, in a really good journal, and you compare an environmental impact assessment to that, and we're talking about orders of magnitude, more complex reviews than, than you see in, in our usual published paper things. So some, a really uh, comprehensive approach is what we'll be talking about there. And the following Thursday, Marta Cole is going to be talking about Eco Ocean, a global ecosystem model to address uh, climate change. So it can be taken very far, but it can also be used very simple. So just like we can use a MICE model for a time dynamic model, you can make very simple uh, spatial models to address more generic questions of, or, uh, about how things be behave and so on and get the, the patterns out of that. When you set up an ecospace model, uh, our key uh, concern has been to make it as simple as possible. And one aspect of that is we're using rectangular cells, uh, not funny shaped ones, or, or uh, but rectangular shapes. Uh, and they are the same size throughout the map. You know, some models will have uh, where less happens, they use bigger cells. Uh, Atlantis is an example of that. But there's a trade-off there, and it's not a question of one is better than the other. There are trade-offs. We're spending more time uh, with regular, with the regular cell size cells everywhere on going through all these cells. You could imagine if you have a coast and you have a, nothing much happening offshore, you just make that one big cell. Uh, there's actually a lot of overhead in that in keeping track of where are things out uh, where things are going to be moving in from out there and other things uh, so um, its bottom line is it doesn't really matter that much what what it is but in echo space it is a grid of rectangular cells that have certain properties so we keep track of what happens in these cells and then we look at movement between cells and how that's impacted by cell conditions. The, uh, what we add on top of that would be fishing effort, which is distributed according to fishing cost and revenue. We are using something called a gravity model uh, for, that, for that purpose, and uh, that's a story for a different day. And of course, increasingly, we are looking more and more at how increasingly being related to climate change questions. We're looking more and more about how things develop as the environment develops as well. So, uh, Ecospace uses this on the same underlying model uh, as Ecosim. Uh, you've seen this a number of times and, um, uh, and it is really the same. We keep, we keep track of how much uh, an organism eat in Ecosim and based on that we calculate production and what happens to production as uh, as we move on. So it's the same parameters. What we're adding to it is the spatial aspects. And uh, here's an example from the North Sea with you can probably see the pixel size if you look. I can't remember what they were in this example here. But it's all cells, rectangular cells like this. And what we need to keep track of, if you think about an ecosystem term, is what, what happens inside the cell plus the interaction with the neighboring cells. And uh, because it's rectangular cells, we uh, only need to keep track for each time step about what happens uh, in 
the um, what happens in four neighboring cells. So an organism cannot move from this cell to the one up here or over here or over here in one time step. It has to go that way. Oh, don't click while I'm doing this. It has to go this way and that way to get over there. So it says something about, um, well, it, it, it has as a, as a rule, I would say, we can actually get a little bit around that when we come talking about some of the things. I'll be talking, I'll bring this up a little bit later. That is an exception. And it's not really important. The main thing is we're setting it up to keep track of what happens there. So the immigration, how much come in to a cell, that's the sum of the, the immigration for this cell is the sum of the immigration in that direction from the four neighboring cell. So a part of the immigration from the neighboring cells becomes the immigration here. We keep track of the, all of these flows you see here. For each cell we have eight flows to keep track of. Now, how much leaves the cell depends on the conditions in the cell. If, if, this, if an organism figures out that, uh, oh, there's too much predation here and feeding is better over there, it, they have a sense for that. They can see, sense gradients. Uh, it may be moving over there. And I should also say, once it moves over there, it's forgotten everything about this one here. Not Well, it has... There's no homing, that's what I'm trying to say. It's not, uh, it's not so that they move back again against the rule. They, they forget about it. So, to get started. Echo space, you have to start with echo part and echo sim. So you construct the echo part model. We talked about the mass balance already. That's, that's what uh, is the foundation for it. Your model if you are at this point looking at this, the, the, uh, it should be quite clear. It's because you have a spatially explicit question you would like to uh, to explore. You still go through EchoSim. You probably still, you may still be doing the time series fitting and all the other things you do in EchoSim to get the relationship, to get the density dependence factors, the vulnerability sorted out. So you run the model to EchoSim to see uh, how it behaves there. Then you create a base map and you enter the additional parameters for EchoSpace. And that's what we'll be doing today. You can add a number of map layers and really you can do uh, very, very complex things by adding layers. And uh, as Jerome also talked about last Thursday, you can make these layers change over time if you use the temporal spatial framework that Jerome has developed. And as mentioned before, it's not good, better, best with regards to these models. It's complex, more complex, and even more complex. And that's really how you should think about it. And this is here is a case where if you can get by with doing less, that's great. And less being less complex, simpler. It may it may be still be a lot of work to do a proper EchoPad model or EchoSim model, but uh, don't think that you have to go to a spatial model unless um, your question is ex is basically explicit. Oh, and also, um, don't think that you have to make pretty maps with this. Um, that's not you are asking a question and answering that spatially explicit question is something that may not require pretty maps. For communication, pretty maps are important. By pretty maps, I mean high resolution uh, spatial, uh, high spatial resolution, many grid cells. Uh, for communication, that, that, can, that, that can be great to, to have these uh, pretty maps. But when you set up a model, don't start with the pretty maps. You start with something that's simpler. I typically have, when I make a, um, a complex or a spatial model that's going to be working on quite a bit, I would typically have three different resolutions. Uh, so for the global model uh, that you'll hear more about next week, we started off with having 
2 degree resolution, 1 degree resolution and half degree resolution. And half degree resolution is something like 160,000 cells. 2 degree is, well, much less and much faster. And you can do much of the work in the coarse resolution. And then you get things to work and gradually you go and in the end you, end, you start using the final resolution for production runs. But all the development runs you do in the coarser and gradually you move over there. The final ones, sure, you can use those and create the, fine, the, the pretty pictures. But if you start there all the time, you'll be waiting. You know, it takes time to run a spatial model. Uh, the a complex model, uh, you know, it might take an hour to run it. And uh, in, in the EWE world, uh, that's a long time. You know, the time dynamic model they really slow, they take a few minutes. So uh, the advantage of that is, of course, that you can this way run more times. That's important because you'll never get it right the first time. You won't get it right the first hundred times you run the model. You have to work on it. You have to find out what, where, where the issues are and gradually you can make the model better. You don't get it right the first time. So uh, it really is uh, important to be able to run the model many times. And we can do that, more even for spatial models. I'll get back to that. Um, it's a, quite a lot of questions going on here. Here's a sample, 20 by 20 grid, that's what we'll be doing in the tutorial for a 25 group model. That means, means you have to solve 10,000 differential equations for each time step. That's, a, that's many. Uh, and they, they are solved explicitly now in, in EWE, in spite of what it says here, it says that now also explicit solution. Uh, threading comes in. Threading is when you have multiple processes and you can do remote um, computing. And then that's, for instance, can be what we do in Ecospace is that we can, if we have a, a, a bigger computer with many processes, you can tell Ecospace that. And then, for instance, it will analyze the different cells separately and bring everything together again. There's quite a bit of overhead in that. So when we're running on a supercomputer, when we get up to something like 60 uh, parallels, then the overhead and keeping track of all of these 60 cats running around in each different direction and getting the results from them, telling them what to do. Can you imagine that? Telling 60 cats what to do and let them run along. Or maybe 60 cats is not because they're not. I'm thinking of herding cats going all directions. Maybe it's more like uh, 60 sheep. Uh, telling them what to do and then getting the information back from them about what they've seen afterwards and telling them where to go next and so on. Um, there's overhead involved in that and when you get to around those, maybe around 60, we can't go any far further. But 60 is also uh, quite, quite a bit. Um, on a desktop computer you won't have that many or a notebook of course. Uh, but you can, if you have 4 or 8 or so, you can, you can use uh, more for it. It will speed up things. Um, another aspect of these computations is that we also have individual based model uh, and that is something I'll be talking a little bit about later. But it runs on Ecospace only for multi stanza groups where we can look at what, uh, what happens to individuals instead of what happens to the biomass pool. With regards to time step, by default it is monthly time step but that can be changed i just been running a model for looking at smalled, salmon smalled movement, tidal movements, where we set it up to run for one month with, with an hourly time step. So we had all the, uh, the tide moving in, out again, and the individual smalled impacts moving around there on the tidal flats and out again and looking at various things related. Well, uh, longer story, but we're not forced into having monthly time steps. Uh, it can be anything, you can just change it. Yeah. So, what you do is when you go to Eric Space, you set up a base map, and that can be a base map like you see it here. This is actually a very coarse model of the Adriatic Sea, as far as I remember. 
And in that base map, you can define things like depth, substrate, and environmental data. So in this case here, it's set up with habitats, which are related to depth and bottom type. And you can also set up marine protected areas. So this red is a marine protected area, and the green are protected areas, and the yellow here is protected areas. They are actually indicated by a net. That's the programmer logic. Oh, it's between the areas. That's where you're not allowed to fish, typically. So that's why there's a net there. You see, a little bit funny logic. It's actually nice, simple. Um, so you set out base map. Then you have to define what's the dispersal rates for each of the groups in your model. How much do they move out of the cell for every time step? Or, or on average per year, how, how fast do they move? You have to define where fishing takes place or attributes related to fishing. Consider whether you should have migration. You might have things coming moving around in here. Uh, does the, how does the water move can be added as well. Uh, sailing cost, like you can, you may have that uh, there are there's a port uh, here that's Trieste up there maybe, uh, and another port, or many ports, and then the boats operating in a certain distance from here. You could have one fleet operating from here, another fleet from up here, another from here, and they might be operating only in, in the neighborhood of those or, or so on. So you can take care of that with sailing cost. Or if you are uh, working on an island in the Caribbean where, the, where people fish only on, on the leeward side, you can just say fishing cost on the upwind side. The, wind, the windy side of the island is too high, so they don't, don't like fishing on that side of it and so on. That's a lot of things you can do with that. If using habitats, it says there, okay, why does it say if using habitats? It's because there are, there are different ways of defining these maps. And you can do it with predefining habitats, but you don't have to. I'll talk about that in, in the next slides. But if you're using these habitats, you have to say for each function group about where do they like to be. So do they like to be on the sand button, the mud button, what depth do they like to be on? Uh, you have to predefine that if you're using these habitats as the only way of defining it. Um, we have additional ways of doing where we're using a momental preference function and habitat capacity model, an envelope model, and we'll come to that next. But these are things you have to say if you're using the habitats only. Habitat preference, how fast they're moving when they are in bad habitats, trying to get back again to the good habitats, how vulnerable they are to predation if they are in the bad habitats. Um, it can be used to make sure that they're being removed from those bad habitats and how much food they can get in the bad habitats. That's the kind of things. Um, so here's an example of, oh, that's uh, Anchovy Bay uh, set up there for uh, with the base map, where we, in this case here we set, by the way, these circles in here means that we press the button. They say that uh, they are, for, to calculate the distance from shore, uh, we're assuming that there are ports everywhere here along it, and we just calculate how far out they are. And that may increase sailing cost as we go further out. It's a little detail, but this here indicates that's where there are ports. that really aren't that many at Anchovy Bay everywhere, but it's okay for this purpose here. So next, uh, Ecospace base input, how we use those habitats. So we are now in, in the Navigator over here. We are in Ecospace input. And then we have various things to look at, and we will look at that in just a few minutes when I stop talking. We come in here to the habitat-based foraging in this example here, since we're talking about habitats. And you can see here for each group in your model, you can use habitat or you can use environmental responses, environmental response functions. If you use Actually, you'll also see these are check buttons, not radio buttons. If they have been round radio buttons, it will be either or. When it's check buttons, it, it means uh, or, and or, it means and or. So you can have one or you can have both. In tutorial, we're going to 
there'll be some habitats and we're going to just do everything here even if we don't define the elemental response function for um, for the tritis we're still going to say a phytoplankton we're still going to just do everything so you can do both but if you only use habitat labs for these groups here then you have to say something about how they prefer the hab uh, how preferred the habitats are and that in this example down here is that uh, they like coastal, they like sand, they like rotten, but in the deep water they are only 80% as as it's only 80% as favorable as the other habitats. So you can you can do those things. Um, I think it's a good idea to use the environmental response functions, uh, and it can be combined well with using habitats. So you may, for instance, have that a certain species only occur on the rocky bottom, uh, but not all rocky bottom. It may be only rocky bottom at a certain depth with a certain temperature or certain, you name it. Uh, and it may change over time this way if we're using the environmental response functions. So it's actually pretty powerful that we have the option of using both, not just one or the other. It really is. We covered this, uh, first part at least. That we have written had only this. We haven't covered this here. I just read the first line here. The habitat capacity model, what it adds to it is it asks the questions why are the species where they are? And then we define this spatial forwarding arena that they for each cell based on the environmental conditions in a cell. So it integrates food web and species envelope modeling. And as mentioned, yeah, you can drive the model with habitat and or habitat capacity, one or the other, or both. So the way the habitat capacity modeling works, and you already saw this from Jerome last Thursday, is that we, for instance, in, in an example here, actually he had his spatial, in his graph there was also spatial, neat spatial down here where we sample it from, but you can have that in your head, the grid, and then what we do is we go out and we define, in this case here, four different preference functions. Um, how good are they for this species here? Um, I can't remember what I called that in, in, in that paper, but uh, play, uh thought it might be, but, but you could think, for instance, of this one here, number two, as being temperature, that they prefer a certain temperature and below or above is less favorable for them. Um, this here might be salinity. They don't like the brackish water. They prefer sal uh, higher saline waters. So when you look on your map, what the computer, or when, when aerospace is running, it will look up the environmental parameters in a cell on the map. And it can be a static cell just as a starting point doesn't have to be wary for every time, but it, it's possible to, to do that, as Jerome talked about. So you look up in each cell, what is, say, salinity, and then you go up and you look how good is that, and you get something that's between 0 and 1 for this. And you do that for all the, say, four environmental parameters, and then you multiply these four readings here on the y-axis y1, y2, y3, and 4, you multiply them with each other. And they're all between 0 and 1. So the product is also between 0 and 1. And that means uh, these are killers. If one of those is no good, it doesn't matter that the other three are perfect. If they don't like the salinity in that cell, they won't be there. That's what, it, that's what this means. So it actually works pretty well at distributing it. Um, sometimes we only have depth. Sometimes we have more. And typically we're talking about using two or three or four, maybe five. I think if you go much, if, if you can't just continue because at some point you're going to get only zeros. And it's a question of how many environmental factors are actually important for um, the, for where species occur. That's what you have to think about. Ask the question again, 
why are species where they are? That's what we're trying, that's what we're looking at, that's what we're modeling with this. And this is what it predicts then. And the way it works, we'll see a little bit later. Um, we covered this. I've said that a few times. The way it's implemented is we're back in the forging arena. And you remember that on top here, you have how a prey can move from being not vulnerable to predation to being vulnerable to predation. And once it's vulnerable to predation, well, this here is exactly like in the forging arena. So the only thing we've added to implement the habitat capacity model is over here, where in the Lotka Voltaire model we had that how much a predator eats of a prey is a search rate that expresses covered that already, but it's it's something to do with interactions between how often a predator will get a prey on with different biomasses and so on. So there's this search rate factor times the number of prey, time, vulnerable prey times the number of predators. That would be the consumption in the foraging arena. What we've added to this in the haptic capacity model is to say for a given cell, this here is the foraging arena size and that's what we calculate from what you saw here. We're using this to calculate this foraging arena size, how big that is as a proportion to what it was initially for that cell in that model under these conditions. So we calculate this and then that impacts how, uh, how well a predator does across the map and that's important then for um, the productivity, how much it eats, impacts the productivity and that impacts the distribution as well. That's a bit all. It's, it really is just adding this to, uh, well, it's not all, but this is, what it, this is how it's implemented. The implications of this, Marta, what is this? I've been talking enough. These Did are the, these are maps of uh, anchovies and hake in in the, an area here in the Catalan Sea, in Spain, and we were we were modeling uh, the one of the preys of of hake, which is anchovy, and trying to understand where were they and and how they were distributed. So it's one of the first applications of this habitat foraging capacity model. Thank you. Uh, isn't it isn't neat that uh, to be able to show a graph and then ask the author to uh, to explain it just like this in the middle <laughs> of a presentation? It is interesting times we're living in. Okay, that's one example of the use of it, and actually it's, it works pretty well. Now there are a few other things you can do. On this here dispersal tab, uh, you have the parameter that is as important in spatial modeling as the vulnerability is in uh, in the time dynamic model. You remember in the time dynamic model, vulnerability, that's your handle for where to set the density dependent factors, how far a group is from carrying capacity. Now, in the spatial model, it's not what corresponds to it, but what is something that is really as important in for, for the predictions, that is this base dispersal rate. It's a factor that's, that gives this interaction between cells. So if you're working on a model and you have a really high factor there and you put in the marine protected areas, guess what? You're not going to see any impact of it because whatever is in there is going to be running out and be fished outside. If you make it smaller, you'll see more impact. You'll see species build up there, just like they do in reality. You know, when you have a marine protected area Fish magically seems to know this is where the border is and build up more inside than, than outside. And the question there is, really is, and on when we're dealing with marine protected areas is, how much is that spillover effect? That's what we need information about. And that's base dispersal rate that this relates to. So this is really a fundamental question, just like for time dynamic model, the fundamental question there is, density dependence, how do species react 
depending on where they are relative to carrying capacity. For the spatial modeling here, the key question is really uh, how does um, how much spillover is there? How much do species um, move around? This space dispersal rate is not a question of how fast a species swim or, or things like that. It's a question of how do you estimate it? It's really difficult. But in uh, you could imagine that you go out uh, in Anchovy Bay and on a certain day of the year, as for instance March, 20, March 30th, you go out and you tack in one spot, doesn't have to be in one spot, you in the bay, you tack, you can be anywhere in the bay, you tack 1000 cod on that day. And here the magic comes in, you go back again the next year on March 30th, and you find all those 1000 cod. This is a magic. And you just measure how much have they moved on average. That's your base dispersal rate, how far they have moved over that year. Uh, they may have decided in the winter to go out deeper water and come back again in the spring. That's fine. Uh, we're not talking about migration, we're talking about dispersal. So how much have they dispersed over that year? So in principle, that's what we're looking for with this rate here. And you can imagine that this magic estimation I talked about there is really, really difficult to get numbers for. So this is a factor that we have to work with in the models. We'll do that later. So this is what's here. Forget this part. Uh, we can also say here if the group is advected, so it doesn't move with the currents, it might be the phytoplankton is moving with the currents. Uh, and we can also say if it's migratory. So did the cod go out to deep water in winter and come back again in the spring? Well, we can move. We can we can let them do that by moving them over the year. If we have reasons to do that, that are important for what we're doing. So that's uh, this screen here, and I covered this already. I think I told you enough about it. What some like to do is to to put in uh, different scales of these magnitudes. Um, it is an important parameter. It's one that needs consideration. That's my main message here. Fishing, uh, you can set it up so that you have any number of um, closed areas and they can be closed seasonally for different months. They can be closed all the time. They can be closed only, a different, uh, they can be closed differently for different fleets. And the MPA plugin that um, Jeroen talked about and showed a little bit about on last Thursday can also be used to make them uh, introduce them at different time as you, as you run it uh, or remove them. So you can use this to replicate the ecosystem history or to look at future scenarios. What if we in five years do this and, and so on? So it's just pre that's pretty neat. Um, yeah, it's a pretty good handle on that. Migration, talked about before, if you said it here is migratory, you can have active movements of migrating species. And uh, you can also have them, for instance, you could have uh, that your groupers in your model, that they aggregate for spawning and spread out again, and that kind of things. And in the temporal spatial framework, we can read in envelopes. Marta will be talking about that uh, Thursday a week. One big issue we keep getting uh, that keep running into is my groups move outside my area. What do I do? Oh, so you're mo you're you're making a model, uh, and your important species um, isn't in the model area, right? Yes. Oh, that's the problem. It really is. We cannot model things that are not in the model. It's, it's, it's kind of that logic that's to it. So what on earth do we do? Well, first of all, you remember I talked earlier about uh, modeling an island like, like the Azores, and, uh, and if your focus is on the fisheries of Azores, uh, you'll have to live with that you have tuna that have the whole North Atlantic. You don't want to model the whole North Atlantic if your focus is 
if your research questions is on this and the tuna is just a minor component that comes in and leaves again every uh, seasonally yeah you're stuck with that you 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 need to do that and and it's in that situation you get in and and this question becomes a, a pertinent question what do you do in that case the problem is of course that if we don't know what they're doing the six months of the year they're not in the area what's the model going to do we can't just move things out one possibility you have to is of course to to drive it with external data but you can and you can for instance move all you could have designated what i've done sometimes is to if i have a map i put a little area over here or somewhere and in that area i let them uh i move them up there when i don't want them in in the rest of the model area it's it's a little bit complicated, but you you have to, one can move them up in in one area, and and in that area give them kind of independent dynamics. That can be all the food they want there, on or, or whatever conditions you will have. Uh, so there's ways around this, but the key question here, a key issue again, is that it's is a problem when you when you have things, we're trying to model things that are not in your model. What is the poor model going to do when it doesn't have anything to work with? Um, so, so that may be an issue. You may also be able to say that. So you have your area, and you can designate a part of that. The area is what the tuna do the rest of the year, and you model that separately over here. So you might have this is the Azores area, and then you have this little area over here, where you have where you model the dynamics of tuna in a separate area. So you just let the tuna go over there. And this area has its own dynamic. There's no interaction between this part and the and let's call it the Azores part. You you may have to do things like that, but you can't you can't just uh, yeah. There are ways around it. Then almost basically always ways around questions of this kind here. Dispersal advection is not migration. So up here, left to the left of is migratory on the dispersal screen. It says. It is 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 dispersed or something like that, and that's where you can set it. And that we may do that to move things like phytoplankton, perhaps zooplankton around with the water if that's uh, of interest. All right, next. Uh, this is where you can set up migration. You can in Ecospace you can set it up so you can have an envelope defined for every month. Uh, and you can then it will then be repeating itself on a seasonal basis if you set it up that way. With a temporal spatial framework, you can have it for every month throughout the run if you set it up that way. These envelopes, or you can have it just for the first month and then have, let it spread, as Martha will be showing next week. So that's quite a lot of flexibility in that. But you can set it up migration uh, in your model and have the species move around or aggregate in certain parts of here and disperse in other parts of the year as, as whatever fits into what you're doing. Uh, indicate here this is where concentrations for every month so we can have them which can tell the center of it and how much disperse how much spread there is around that or it can be envelopes that we read in for every month. Advection, there's a simple advection button built in. Uh, if you can get it from a hydrodynamic model, that's definitely preferable. This thing is simple and a bit tricky to work with. Uh, and yeah, getting it from a hydrodynamic model is complex, time consuming, may be better to get it to reviews, uh, may even be better than this, absolutely. But uh, there's a way of doing it here. Sailing course we talked about we can set the, we can define ports and then we can ask the program to calculate the distance from these ports in a simple manner to get an expression for sailing costs. And what comes out of that is spatial distributions. Nice maps here we're still in the Adriatic that shows distribution, predicted distribution by group by time step. So you have this maps for for everything, and um, an important part of this is all of these maps are saved. So we have, we have summaries of them are saved, and also uh, they're saved as uh, spatial text files, and uh, it's.
quite feasible to, for instance, set it up in R to read these maps and manipulate these maps and, and work with them. Uh, you'll see some examples of that in, for instance, in Vaso's presentation on Thursday of uh, how this is done and also, of course, in Marta's the following week. But the data is there, you can work with, you don't have to work with these pictures here. They're nice for what, for them, for, they are really nice for, uh, as the whole interface in EWE, the important part of that one is to give you an idea about what the model is doing. That's what, that's why we have an interface for you to be able to work with for presentations and so on. Of course, it's, uh, it's neat to go in and, uh, and make them yourself. And while we are at it, you have map and plot, they are in the new version, the other way around to the default is the plot, which is just gives a plot like an echo same time dynamic plot. Uh, when you're running Aerospace, if you're looking at these nice pretty maps here, uh, it takes quite a while to do that. So for the computer, there's quite a bit of overhead in that. So uh, you pay a price in, in your own time for sitting and looking at these maps. Uh, if you have seen them, enough of them, uh, run it with the plot instead and uh, the runs will be, will be faster. You'll see in a few minutes, if you haven't done it before, how fast they they are for Anchory Bay, but this will give you an idea about it. So Ecosim, the Ecospace predicts spatial distributions, fishing efforts, and so on. It gets the base effort from Ecopart, and then it predicts uh, how that effort changes with, uh, with this gravity model. Uh, and you can actually set in that model how good the fishers are at finding the fish. There's a power function that you can, uh, you can set in uh, Ecospace Fishery here, uh, you can set this power function that, you know, if you put a very low power, the fishing really will spread out. With the default power there, they're pretty good. It's, it's uh, I've hardly ever changed that power. Uh, it gives a very reasonable representation of how well fishers can find the aggregation of fish. So, how the how fishing effort is concentrated based on where the fish are, you know, fishermen are pretty smart. All right. Then there is the eco space individual based model. This is a model where for each time step, we're talking about multi stanza groups now, and multi stanza groups. When you think about it, you, one thing you may remember is that. In there, we're keeping track of the number of, we have a recruits, or we have a number of X or larvae being, for each time step, we generate this number of um, offspring based on the conditions of the adults. So the recruitment to the larvae, egg larval stage, one month old, really depends on the conditions for the adult. It's not a stock recruitment relationship built in, but that's what happens there. And then we model what happens to this group, these individuals for every month, how they grow and how they die and what the results are of that for the biomass and for the population. Now in Ecospace, when we do this, we can decide that these individuals are somewhere on the map. So each, we, we, we put them into packets of, um, of individuals and we keep track of, let's say as a, there's no number for it really because it's just units. But let's say there's a thousand when we started. And then we keep track of how they die off. It's still a packet, but we know now after one step, instead of being a thousand, there's only 950 and we know how they're grown based on the food. So we can calculate what the biomass is. So we have both position, we know the numbers in them, and we know how they, how they, uh, the conditions they've been encountering. And the conditions they are encountering depends on what's in the environment. How's the food conditions? Or how is the environment? How do they like the environment? How much food is then there? What's the prey conditions? How many predators are there? What's the predation risk? And what's the fishing risk? Fishing effort in, in that area. We keep track of that. And then they move around at random. And this is actually where they might be able to move uh, from uh, more than one cell because we're keeping track of that on a finer time scale. So that was the exception I talked about earlier. 
So that's uh, the individual based model, uh, which we've uh, used in, in a number of cases, including to demonstrate that it can give very similar, the two models, Echospace and, and IBM, gives very similar predictions. Actually, um, in this analysis I just did for the small movement, that's relating to this Robert Spank project that um, that uh, Vaso will be talking about on Thursday, looked at, used both models to predict how many salmon small there would be in a certain area based on this new terminal being built. The two models gave almost the same answer to, you know, based on the movements, suddenly you, you put this big terminal in there, how many will make it around the terminal. The two models, uh, while being uh, kind of rather different, I mean, the um, they're different in the sense that the, the um, standard model is rather deterministic, is deterministic, it's the same results you get every time because what happens from one time cell depends on the neighboring conditions and there's no deterministic aspect of that. But in the in this model here, when using that one, the movement of the packets is random. And it's but there's a lot of random things happening. And when I ran these two models, uh, the um, outcome of it was really, really quite quite similar, not the same numbers or anything like that. It was something like one model would give 0.9 and the other would give 0.85 as the answer. Some, there was that kind of difference there was in predicting the impact of putting this big terminal there. So uh, that's, that's actually another example that would be, I should replace this one here with that other example. Um, so that's the spatial temple uh, data framework, which you heard a lot about from, from Jerome. And I see now I've been talking for an hour and I'm, as usual, really lousy at, in, at estimating how long time I can talk about a simple predict, uh, lecture like this. I had guessed 30 to 45 minutes when I was rehearsing it a couple of days ago. Um, anyway, uh, this is really powerful. Uh, it's, not in the, it's not active in the distributed version uh, because setting it up uh, is one of these, you call the block the Ghostbusters, or you call the programmers, or the kind of busters are the data busters, the spatial data busters. You know, you, you, you basically get, uh, get your own and Joe to, uh, to uh, work with this, and that's, it's a little bit complicated. But once it's set up, uh, it works. I have, ish, I have, I have setups that was made six, seven years ago that I'm still capable of running very nicely, even though things have been updated and so on. Now, where do you get the parameters from would be a next question. And uh, once you basically, when you set these up, you need to set up environmental preference functions as we're going to be doing here in the next hour. Uh, Acromaps is a good source for that. Deng Palomares talked about that uh, an eternity ago, almost in this course. Uh, where well, we have distributions there which are related to depth, temperature, salinity, primary production, and sea ice concentration, not in the tropics. But um, these factors, based on that, it creates you can create envelopes and uh, and read those in. Um, for Billy. the Robert Spank, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to mention quickly that now there's also oxygen. And uh, we are going to update this interface so we can also bring in the response functions of oxygen that now Aquamaps has. The nice thing about this is here you can get it for basically all species. If you have a more uh, detailed analysis, like the Roberts Bank that the Vasa would be uh, talking about, in that case we had 35,000 hours of sampling in the area. And from that we could make the distributions maps about. So at what uh, depths do things occur, at what salinities, at what cur uh, current conditions, uh, and what type of button, and uh, five factors like that is what we used in that case. It was, so it was from mainly, for many of the groups, it was from empirical sampling. From others, it was from literature. So there are ways of getting this. That's, uh, that's the key message here. Okay, 
We are almost there. Construct an echo space model. Set up the food web. Read in depth maps. We're going to do this. Read in maps. That's it. Billy, I, I have a, a question comment. There's, I don't know if you talked last week about it. Uh, there's some things from Ecosim that don't travel to Ecospace, and it's important to to take into account. So everything that is not that doesn't have a, a special explicit information in Ecosim won't travel to to Ecospace, like your your time series, your your forcing functions of temperature or salinity. If you use them in in a temporal model, you, and you run the eco space, you are not bringing in that into your special model. That's that's something that you need to to take into account. <coughs> what it does travel is fishing effort. Fishing effort and mediation is transferred over because those two are not because we have a model that deals with how to how to handle the. Um, how to handle the fishing efforts, the gravity model, and because mediation is not spatial, it depends on the cell biomass. Uh, forcing functions such as uh, average temperature in the area, what will we do with it when we get to a spatial model? The temperature is not going to be the same everywhere, so we need to have it spatially explicit. So those forcing functions uh, are really of no use in a spatial model. Uh, if you really want to use them, you could use. No, you would never. I can never imagine anyone going in and uh, and putting the same temperature everywhere on the map. It, it would, yeah. It would make. No, you wouldn't do it that way. So that it, it's quite logic when you when you start thinking about it, which ones are transferred and which ones are not. Let's see if I can share my. The Easter egg. Again, you can say whatever you want to do about uh, about EWE, but we certainly have the best logos, and that's one of those damn programmers, Jerome. I promised him I would uh, use that expression in every class, or maybe I promised him I wouldn't do it. Can't quite remember. Anyway. Um, I'm going to open a version of the Anchovy Bay. Oh, my license has expired. I can still continue. So we have, uh, and if you are, when you're doing this, uh, don't worry about uh, what version you are using. It doesn't matter. What we're going to do now is we're going to uh, open, so we open this uh, now, and I'm going to go to Echo Space. See, normally I would go in here and I would just uh, take one of the existing scenarios here, or if it had been Echo Sim, I would take scenario or time series. But uh, when I go straight to Echo Space, uh, first of all, it's going to look here and see, oh, there's only one Echo Sim scenario, so I don't have to ask which one to open, I just open that. That's the talking program. Uh, in here, we can actually go, we could open that, but I could also just do a new one. Echo space. What? I should be able to do that. I can't do that. Load scenario. No, it only loads the existing. Oh, do I have to have an echo sim first? I have one echo sim. Now I can do it. Okay. New scenario. Oh, that's because when I went in there to load the scenario, it loaded echo sim. And once you have echo sim loaded, then you can create a new scenario. And it's the kind of logic. It's it is it is logic, yeah. Uh, new scenario. Just give it a name so I know it doesn't matter. Now we are on echo space. Input. Echo space parameters. Here you can decide what kind of model you want to use. Uh, is it the uh, 
multi-stance or the individual based model. There's no multi-stance in this model, so I can't run the individual based model here. But if you do actually, uh, if you have one with multi-stance, uh, all it takes is just to click this one here, and you can uh, you can take off the default parameters are there. It's easy to set it up to run it, uh, and you can then always make it uh, improve it as you move along. But for this here, this is fine. And this is all we have. All we need to do. We're going to be running 41 uh, year simulations here, and then we go to maps. Um, this, yeah. So now we're going to create a spatial map to use for this tutorial. So we are here on maps, and uh, over here on the right you see edit base map. I'm Given that I have nothing there, that's a good place to start. So I go edit base map. And uh, I'm going to make it 20 cells, 20 rows, and 20 corals, if I can type that. Uh, so we get 400 cells to work with now. And again, you can make pretty maps by making this bigger. But you pay a price in um, the time it takes to run it. So don't start with the production runs with the fine resolution. Uh, it is fairly simple if you are working even on a more complex model that when you create those maps you create them at at least two resolutions, a course and the production one. So you have a, a development version. Uh, if, if you're making these maps in R, for instance, it is really quite simple to aggregate them and have, of course, a version of them. So one thing more I want to do here is to set the cell length. I set it here to 20 kilometers. That cell length is important. I just need to do it in one of these. Then it will calculate the uh, degrees here. It is important to um, think about this because the dispersal rates relate to this. And you can see if I only have 20 kilometer cell and I have 300 square kilometer uh, dispersal, what's going to happen? Uh, you see that actually. I'm going to, sh to show that in a little while. OK, let's go back. See, it closed it down because now it has changed things quite a bit here. And now we can go here and click on Depth or on this one here. And we see nothing. I could go in here and I could actually um, say we have water. And I could uh, do like this. And you can do that. You can. You could sketch a map, or you can you, you can do this for all of them. Go in and uh, you could even smooth them. Start to make it start to make it look like data. See there? Now we're getting it. Now we're getting somewhere. We're getting a, a whole map now, just by smoothing it. This looks like. It almost looks like Anchovy Bay. So that's one way you can set up a map. And playing is important in modeling. And doing things like this, try something, see if it works, is how you learn uh, a lot. You don't need you don't need to get oh I need all the right data before I can start running my model. You're going to waste a lot of time if you take that approach. Compare it to that you set something up, you see how it works. They say that 80% of the insight comes from 20% of the effort. And in, eco in ecosystem modeling and modeling in general, it's easy to spend 80% of the work without getting to run the model and get zero of the insight. Getting the model up and running is a little, it's a tiny effort compared to getting all the data sorted out. That's what the time consuming part really is. That's what takes the time. So getting the model set up and start running it and starting to figure out 
what it does is uh, really efficient. Now we're going to go edit base map. So I'm going to read in real data. Oh, no, we're not going to go edit base map. We're going to do something else. Sorry. You have depth here. You see over there to the right, you see a little icon. I'm going to double click that. You can do that with all of these and it brings up this interface here. Here, yeah, you can change colors and so on, but you can also go to data. And here you have the data. But it's not the data we want. So, uh, there is a spreadsheet on the course website. You can download uh, from the, sorry, it's not on the course website because we can't put Excel spreadsheets on uh, Google sites. But it is, there's a link to it in the tutorial. And that link is to, see if I can figure out how to do, oh shoot, it's probably up here. Spatial Entry Bay Spreadsheet. There we are. Um, and it, when I say, uh, see if I can figure it out, it's because I'm doing this in Windows Excel, which I'm not used to, but I have to use it to copy from there over to uh, to the win to the echo part I'm using in Windows here. This uh, cut and paste doesn't always work nicely when you're going between Mac and Windows. So I do this. I use right click, copy here, and then go back again. Here, click up on the right there, copy. A right click paste. Now we have real data and a map of Anchory Bay read in. Pretty simple. And now we need to parameterize the habitat capacity model. And uh, we'll start off by doing this manually. So that's our next point. Hmm, how do we do that? Habitat based foraging here. Oh, I have actually one done one already. I'm sh quickly going to go and I obviously have been uh, preparing for this class. Um, so I go into habitat capacity foraging and I get a blank screen. I'm going to go down here in the lower left and say add. And now I have a function and I'm just going to go something like this. It doesn't really matter. Get rid of this over here. Now I have defined something, a shape. What is it? Well, it's uh, this is supposed to be how cart reacts, the preference for, for depth. And I'm going in here, I'm changing the axis now. I put 400 as, that's X min and that's X max. So I'm going to define this axis here, 400. Now she changes here, it's from zero to 400. We still don't know what it is, but that doesn't matter too much right now. And it is, uh, it's depth that it relates to. I click the depth up here. And you see a histogram showed up here. Now this histogram shows up because because I clicked the depth, yes. But what it shows is a histogram of the depth values in Anchory Bay. So we can see here that cod actually favors the deeper parts, according to my make-believe make environmental preference function. Uh, it, it favors this part here, which, which is a more, not the most common part. It can also occur here. So this is going to be used to distribute card over, over space. I say OK. And then I go to next thing would be group capacity model. Use environmental responses is not checked. Here they have all use habitat. I'm going to change that. So I click it. I go up here and I change false to true. Now we have check marks everywhere. Now we're going to apply it. And I want to apply it. I can apply it just to cut. 
here. So I take this one, I move it over, and we now have uh, it applied over here. Once more. I don't know. Oh, it's. I was just confused by this Excel showing up. That's just because it's behind, and uh, I don't know why. But you go over here. I can also remove it, and then you go and you put it over. You may have a hundred over here. We have a Robert's bank. I think we have about two hundred over here, and we we move it over the ones we want for a given group, and that's it. So now we applied this uh, momentum preference function, which I gave no name. I could actually over here where it says values called it depth pref card ah no I can't didn't want to I don't know why I should be able to do that done that before um this Billy, is you can you see. can change in you can change it directly in environmental response one if I can you do it down click. there. I, yeah. Yeah. I think so. Oh. Yeah, over there. Now I have okay, okay. That's about it. Did I forget anything? Uh, I'm going to go to fishery, echo sim, input, fishing effort, and I'm just checking if I had the time series ready in these, uh, there, there will be things happening and that will make it a little bit difficult to understand what happens in my make belief model he right here. So I want to know what I have there. I don't have anything. If I had anything time series ready in, I would just have reset all at this point. Run echo space. And we run it. Oh, I forgot to put, show it at pretty maps. And for some reason, I can't get up there while I'm running. Anyway, you can see now the time it takes to make. Oh, there you can go. Now I can do it. A 41. Can't I? Yeah, there we are. So you can see now the cart has a distribution that's based on depth and depth only. That's all we do here. And uh, that's about it, what I want to show with this. You could try to change this and see what the implications are, but uh, let's go to something with more data instead. And see how we work with that. So that would be the next step. We made the run here. Um, I should just mention you can, you can extract results from uh, from echo space runs just like an echo sim and a neat thing about uh, echo space when we're talking about results is that when you go to maps uh, there's something called regions here uh, you can define regions like I click on this I could say I want to have uh, five regions Could be for each habitat, but what I can do now is I can go in regions and I could read in or I could just sketch that uh, this here is one region or uh, this here would be another region. Now you can have statistical areas where you have what happens now is when you run echo space. And you look at it afterwards, or you look at the files that it generates, you can get in here, if I can get there, in the res I can't do the results because I haven't run yet, okay. But you, but uh, what would happen is that it will, it will calculate what's the biomass, what's the fishing pressure, and so on in these regions. So it's a nice way of getting results out. Uh, really useful. But we're going to go somewhere else now. We're going to go to another model. We're going to go to a spatial model that has more data in it. And this one, you, there's a zip file where you can uh, you can load it from there. So 
we back in Anchovy Bay. And do, do, do. let's go to Bay of Anchovies. So now I'm lo loading an existing scenario that has more stuff in it, more data in it. Let's go and look at what's in here. Um, we're going to go back to Ecospace Input Habitat Based Foraging. So we're in here now. And you'll see here that, oh, there's lots of things happening here. I can actually hide this over here. Or to hide it so we can see more. Um, we have all these different functions defined now. Next, we're going to use them. And means we go back in the navigator. If I can get it out, come back here. And we're going to go and look at group capacity. Well, apply forging responses first. And you see that right now there's nothing defined here. Can you move away, please? So that's why I have to go and define group capacity model. Um, use environmental responses as before. We want to do that. So we change that to true. There we go. We have that now. And now we can go back to apply foraging responses. And you see here in this one, we saved already uh, which ones are in here. Uh, but it, really what you do for this is you go in, you click a cell, and you find, for instance, this, like, um, as an example. Uh, I, I was just applied a depth one to a temperature, which is, of course, nonsense. And that's why that, uh, it didn't show up. But I just want to show you again that I remind you how it's done. I removed that one again. It's gone now. So this is how you can easily set it up. Um, let's run the model now. See what happens. Output. Run echo space. When I've done this, I'm going to be playing with uh, uh, protected areas to show you how to set that up. It's not mentioned in the tutorial, uh, but uh, let's do it nevertheless. So I'm going to go to a map here, and you can see there's different things we can display. I'm just going to do this, and when I've done that, I'm, uh, I'm going to do two things. One is to just look at the different screens in Ecospace and, and briefly explain what's there, and then we're going to set up a marine protected area and look at some of the properties of, uh, in, of parameter settings when we run it. So here, go in, I click Run, and, uh, and it runs, and it creates these uh, spatial maps for how things uh, change, pred predictions for how things change over time, or have changed over time. And that's basically what we are looking for. I should mention here that if you, when you run your own model, if you have uh, that uh, the uh, phytoplankton and soil plankton are behaving really, really wildly, lots of fluctuation in, in really crazy dynamics, it's a very special properties of some of the models in Anchovy Bay that can get into this, that, to that fluctuation. If you have that in your version of the model, it has to do with the setting for phytoplankton that you have POB, in early, some versions of the model have 9 there and 240 there. That's because from Anchor Bay we only had the total production, so the product of those two. And in an early version I put these numbers in. They lead to an instability in echo space, this, this fast turnover there. 120 is actually a more reasonable turnover rate than, than 240, that was too high. Um, so these numbers here work much better. And now I stupidly enough changed them and you see what happened? Sorry, I'm not supposed to call myself that or anyone else, but um, the uh, it closed down everything. So I'm 
it probably thinks I was changing the model. So of course it, it, it forgot about the one. Let's go back again. Sorry. Uh, come on. Took you on a trip to nowhere there. Actually, we don't we don't even need to to do this now. Uh, you saw them you saw the maps before, uh, and we and you're going to see them again. Let's rather um, walk through the menu. So we're going to see if we can get the this one back again. Yeah, it's not pinned now. Oh, maybe it is pinned now. Uh, so let's look at what's in in Echo Space. Input parameters we covered as this includes where you set up the individual base model. Um, number of threads, this is where you can multi-thread it. So I have two threads here in my version because I have four processes and uh, I have two processes with four, co four two cores and four processes or whatever it is. I can do four, so I'm using two for Mac and two for Windows here. Um, That's about it. Auto save results, you have some of that here. As you will remember, I'm sure, this is also when you go up to that floppy disk up there, this is also where you can decide what you want to change or what you want to save. And these are saved and as files that you can work with in our very convenient. Uh, maps, we covered that. Uh, this is, oh, you see here, I've already put in a, a marine protected area uh, there. I'll, uh, if we go through this here, when you want to set up the marine protected area, you by default it will say MPAs zero. Then you click the little uh, pen, and when you do that, uh, you can add MPAs and you can have any number of MPAs. So I have one now, and what I've done is to go in, click here. And down here, I can um, create my protected area. We're going to be using that in, in a little while. Um, Habitat-based foraging. This is We've seen that, how we set it up. Here you can also see for the different groups uh, the computed foraging capacity for there's nothing for whales but anyway you can see how they look here I'll, I'll skip over that we looked at we saw a screenshot of this earlier this is the important base dispersal rate which is set here to 300 for everything we'll just leave it there for now there's the advection model which we won't talk more about right now aerospace fishery marine protected areas so here you can define the marine protected area you have that we just put in there. Uh, is it closed for fishing or not? So now I can open it or close it. For, so check mark means it's closed for fishing all year round. Um, when is it enforced or for which groups is it enforced? In our case, we can say it's just for trawlers. Since we'll be mainly be looking at cod and, and whiting as we do this. It's something called habitat fishery. Uh, this can be used to distribute the fishing, and by default here, uh, they are allowed to fish everywhere. But we could, for instance, have the trawl fisheries. They can't work on the rocky bottom, as an example. Might not work, be allowed to work in the coastal area either. But uh, that's just to illustrate uh, how things uh, how things work. There's fleet dynamics. Um, this is the two parameters here. Effective power is used in the gravity model as an exponent, an exponent of one, so it doesn't do anything. But if you increase that exponent, say to two or three or five, it makes the fisherman better and better at finding the fish. And uh, if you go below one, uh, all the way down to towards zero. You can have that they won't know where the fish is they're going to be fishing everywhere and of course uh, having data about where fishing actually happens 
is how you make it better. But the default value is pretty good. So uh, I don't even remember anyone doing anything serious with this, para this power parameter. And this here, total efficiency multiplier, uh, is a scaling that may be useful when uh, you have fishing happens only in a very small part of the area. You may have to use this multiplier to avoid uh, that the fish, because they are aggregated, because fishing aggregate in a little, little area really hammers them in, in an unrealistic way that can be handled with this multiplier there. So that goes on top of it. MPA dynamics. Jerome talked about that. I, I won't. Uh, I won't go into details about it. This is where you can set the time stage of it. Then there is external data, uh, which uh, does not work. In, like even in my case here, because my my license uh, isn't on this version here. Um, but uh, this is uh, why you need Jerome uh, and uh, and the GoPro, the Pro version. The um, Transects, you can define transects and get data just for transects. And that's about it. So let's let's run it now with an MPA. And just to make things a little bit more interesting, I'm going to go to EchoSim. And EchoSim, I'm going to go to Fishing Effort. And for the trawlers, the ones that are impacted marine protected areas, I'm going to set them to a value of 2. So now I have doubled, oh, I think it was there already from, from my playing with the model here before. It was already at 2, uh, not at 1. But yeah, I just, I'm doing this with just with increased fishing uh, by trawlers so we get a little bit more uh, impact of the marine protected area. So now we're going to go back and we're going to run Ecospace. Actually, we're going to do a couple of runs. Uh, let me go to Habit MPA Enforcement and I'm going to remove the MPA. And then we're going to go run. And we're going to, we're going to look here first at fishing effort. Going to look at the map. I'm going to run it. Uh, so we have trawlers fishing effort there, and nothing is happening, of course, because um, well, because they are um, fishing. They're not impacted by the MPA. We can even see. I think part of the MPA is going to be in that area where they where they don't fish because it's rocky bottom. So we might actually want to. Oh yeah, the cut is over on that uh, button there. Oh, they are at the rocky button. I'll show you again. Fishing effort. This area where, where there's no effort, that's because it's rocky button. So uh, we're going to go back to for what we're doing, the habitat fishery. Since we're playing now to see the MPA impact, we're just going to go once more and run it. And now they can fish there. Speed things up a bit. See if I can get to... I have some issues with my mouse. I'm running in this window so I can't... It won't let me move my mouse. So we have to wait 41 years spatial modeling runs before I can... before I can do anything. You see how long time it takes to do that with 400 cells? Still and this is a, not the newest computer I'm using. So uh, you could also see in graph here, you can see what where cod are. So that's the seal sign off. The cod are doing whoops, uh, impact of doubling the fishing effort. You see that they go down to 20-30% of their biomass. So now I'm going to go to Ecospace results. And I would go in here and I would just remember that uh, cod has a biomass at the end of point 8. 
0.797 and that the catch at the end is 0.222. Fine. Now we're going to introduce the uh, MPA. So we're going to enforce the MPA for trawlers. And go and, go and run Ecospace. Going to go map, going to your fishing effort, going to run. And you can see now they're not fishing in this area. Then we're going to go, go relative to biomass if I can. Oh, let me show me. I was so close. Uh, please show me relative to biomass. Oh, I got it here. And you look at cart. And do you see a build-up in the uh, protected area? I think we can show MPA here. Let's just do that. Should have remembered that. So you see there's no fishing there. So what's happening here? Does anyone have any idea? I can remove this again. And I can actually... Show selected groups, or we can just show card. That's seals. Anyone have any suggestions for what's happening? Looks like the MPA doesn't have any impact. You can't see, you can't see that uh, where they are. Maybe a higher in there, but it's nothing. You know. No, it seems like there is only impact on, in the areas that are uh, environmentally um, preferred by COD, and not in the areas that are not preferred by COD. And still, it does, be happening. Um, yeah, it does look quite a bit like that. Um, that the MPA doesn't lead to any build-up. Now, uh, there's a reason for that. Cell size is 20 um, kilometers and base dispersal rate is 300. That means for every time step they can move on, on, on the average, they will just move to a neighboring cell, many of them. Uh, if I lower this to say 10, this base dispersal rate, I'm going to say cut, they stick around. So let's see what happens now. Oh, I see an MPA effect right away. So if you want efficient MPAs, uh, this is really important. You just lower that and you get much more efficient MPAs. That's why you can get much better results. I'm not, I'm being deadly serious here in the sense of I'm saying this is really important for evaluating the effects of protected areas and for a number of other things. But you can see there, uh, you can see the impact it has on the predictions. Certainly we, we see them. Um, when you actually watch with this full model, it's a little bit different to see. You might be able to see some impacts on spin-off impacts on other groups as well uh, from this protected area. But uh, well, in this case here, it also protects whiting, but whiting, the way I placed it, doesn't really, if I put the MPAs on top here, you have an MPA for whiting. Uh, but it hardly touches the whiting distribution area, so it has very little impact for that group. Trawlers take uh, cod and whiting, so that's why this area also has, in principle, should impact whiting, but because they're not there, it doesn't. That's... Um, a way of working with MPAs. You have the capacity. 
come in for drivers. Temperature and distance from coast is what we have. And depth. See the MP effect, there's no catches inside. Yeah, questions? Please. There is a question in the chat. Um, hold on, Harris, do you want to? Yeah. Okay, let's sure. see the chat. Um, is it possible to apply the environmental drivers to individual species within a composite functional group? So if you had a group like pelagics, which has a number of different individual species, and you have empirical uh, preference functions for temperature, but you might have different preferences for the different species within that whole functional group. Is that something you would want to do outside of ecospace and then kind of put it all together and then bring it in? Or is there any mechanism? Uh, Marta, should we let him wait nine days for the answer? Or what do you think? <laughs> well, we can answer today. Um, yeah, yeah, there is a way to combine it. So you, you could do it outside by just waiting the, the response functions of individual groups by the biomass, if you have it, or relative importance of the of the species within the group. If you don't have that, you could use uh, catches. If you assume that catch uh, gives you a relative importance of the species within the area. And um, we have a tool that uh, does that for, for functional groups that have many species. It's, it's not released with the version, but we can definitely share it with you. If, uh, that's that's what we use. We we just use this um, this uh, small program that we we give it the the proportion of the biomass and the response function of the individual species in the groups, and then gives you the response function of the group. Okay. So so um, just adding to what Marta is saying there, so she, and she will be talking more about this uh, Thursday a week, when talking about the global eco ocean model. But Holden. Um, Getting back to your question again, or another aspect of this question is again, you have to go back and uh, think about the, your research question. So, for instance, if you uh, if your small pelagics would be uh, in in Peru, it would be sardine and, and anchovy. Uh, mm. I would say that's a really poor defined pelagic groups because they come they were there at different times, and uh, you should really split that into. Uh, to two groups that was probably going to be much uh, more pertinent for answering your your research questions, whatever that is. In the case of the global model, um, that there was no way of doing it that way because uh, in we we're trying to look at biodiversity issues, and that meant that a functional group at a given uh, at a given look uh, cell in each for each cell, the functional groups may have different species composition. Mm -hmm. So there is absolutely necessary to keep track of what happens within the functional group. That fits in with the research question again. That's that's what leads it. So that's why that uh, that for that we have this more el elaborate way of handling species within the functional groups. Yeah, it also if it's important, split it. Yeah, it's, and it's also important to, to look at the response functions of the species. If the, the species are responding in a very similar way, like any any response function will do in the sense that you will capture well the the average response of the group. If you have two species that are responding very differently, imagine that you have joined, I don't know, um, um, horse mackerel species or mackerel species, and then you realize that one is, is more, um, prefers a, colder water the other one warmer water then you may want to, to want to split them because otherwise you will get this response function that it's it's really a mix of two two species that respond very differently see that's very useful because i have data for that but um 
I need to dig into that to look into that, and that makes sense. He, if they're similar, if you have two different mackerels and they behave the same, then you can maybe just treat them the same. Um, but it might be interesting if one could be shifting, you know, moving within the other, which I'm, I know you're working on on a really large scale. Thank you. Good. Billy, are we having an, a student um, talking about papers today? I think I see here on the 30th of March we have Nicole. Is that happening? I forgot. You forgot yeah, to, I have a. I forgot to check. I have a presentation prepared. That's great. Oh, like fantastic! Minute, so. And we, 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 of course we are. <laughs> I would never dream of forgetting that matter. How can you even think I would dream? Uh, I could do that. No. And we have time, so that's even better. We got time. Um, I will leave it to you. Uh, give me a second here. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, Nicole, I will uh, leave it to you to because I don't really remember what 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 the paper is. Sorry, that's one thing I forgot. Okay, well I'll remind you what the paper is. So, <laughs> ah, uh, can you see it? Yes, we see it fine. Okay, yeah, so I was um, going to talk about this paper here. So the, uh, they did a, an eco-sim and eco-space model for the Celtic Sea. Um, yeah, so they were looking at the abiotic environment and fishing, or the impacts of the abiotic environment and fishing in the Celtic Sea ecosystem. So they used EcoPath with eco-sim and eco-space for the time period of 1985 to the 2016. So their ecosim model was driven by a time series of uh, fishing effort, primary production, zooplankton habitats, uh, suitability, abiotic environmental variables, and then it was fitted to abundance and fisheries catch data. Their eco space model was built using the ecopath model from ecosim plugin so that um, that plugin created six models corresponding to the mean conditions over five um, five year periods. So the their model was informed by several other uh, models and data sources. So they, for example, they had an ex a couple existing EcoPath models for the area. They had this Eco Diet model um, to estimate the diet proportions of the different groups. They had a vertically generalized production model to um, model spatial temporal changes in the production of phytoplankton groups. And then they had this new niche model of mesozooplankton. <clears throat> so they have this schematic here um, showing all the different um, data sources that they that they plugged into the model. So it was quite extensive. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, so they, they found that fishing was the main driver of ecosystem changes, followed by trophic interactions and then the environmental variables. So this is just the output um, of some of the different model fits. So the black line is their best fit model. So it had, um, yeah, the parameters that I mentioned. Um, yeah, so then the last two key points were is that um, they, they argued that trophic relationships have to be defined as accurately um, as possible as this, this had the biggest impact on their model. And then this uh, could be a valuable tool for the spatial management of fishing activities. Yeah, that's what I have. Thank you very much, Nikon. Excellent. And it, it really goes to show that um, there are lots of neat applications out there and we are seeing more and more well-developed spatial models emerge. I've been really impressed just by uh, when looking for presentations. I mean, 2020 was overwhelming in the number of uh, publications coming out. 2021 is continuing at that pace. Uh, so there are lots of things. There are really many neat applications uh, to 
use as inspiration when designing this kind of, of studies. Um, yeah, it's it's great to see what's happening. Jr had a question. Do you want to post that? Yeah, Shahar, my name. Uh, how does the Ecospace calculate the initial conditions? Uh, I mean, uh, you have the, what is the pulse, the biomass dispersion space? Um, if we go back to uh, using it, um, now there are two options there, kind of four. You can uh, you can start the model by just Ecospace would put everything in every cell. So it would just have a flat map. Uh, in the Ecosim parameter page, the first page there, you can set it up to use, um, uh, oh, what's the word for it? Uh, to base it on the habitats instead, or instead of using the, the blank. So it can go in and it can also distribute it based on habitat or habitat preference. And that's what we generally do. So if we're using environmental preference functions, as in the example we just saw, as we initialize the spatial model, it will calculate for um, for that star situation, how good, say for cod, how good each cell is, so it maps the space and it says this here is uh, how much habitat preference we have for cod out of this, on this bigger map. So it takes that and then it takes the biomass and it distributes it in in that area and only in that area. And and that's the rule that's the way we generally do it then when we start off. So they it's it's the habitat capacity that decides where they are as we initialize the model. Fantastic. Because we are at the point uh, of uh, closing down this session for today. So let me thank you.